All right, so uh, Yvonne can't be with us tonight, so we're gonna we're gonna get through this. Um, and she has just other things to do. She said this wasn't important tonight, so it's been been a late day. Still haven't done my treadmill. Uh, last night I I just felt ill, so I couldn't get all the way through the treadmill. And no, not wheezing, coughing, ill, just sick to my stomach. And I think it's just the the daily stress. I started taking a toll, so I've always had a stomach that doesn't react well to stress. And I figure that's what it is. So, uh, yeah, so with Yvonne's absence and all. Oh. Oh, she's she's here. May we all rejoice. You're such a brat. I'm sorry. Whatever. It is kind of your fault, though. What's my fault? Everything. You're such a brat. So... I just had to get more of the... Sure you did. Caps to pin together. Uh-huh, yeah. Okay. Lots and lots. So. Lots and lots. Addison had to land on the ground and now faces a security guard at the front door with Chelsea at his side. He's with me, she says, as if she's an army general. She gives Addison a confused look. Hey, my father runs the place. This guy works for me. The guard rolls his eyes, but he does open the door and allow them entry to the special operations building. They walk through the lobby... And Addison is already shaking his head at all the propaganda in the room. Posters and cardboard standees telling them how awesome the military is at protecting people. Why are you shaking your head, she asks. These people work hard to protect you, you know, she says defensively. Addison takes a deep breath. He always does this before starting a rant. This planet has a terrible record with civil rights, equal rights, or any, or any variety, really. Everything involves a war before people smarten up and decide maybe killing people's a bad idea. This building is founded on an idea that killing a lot of people can be a really good idea since people in the building think it's a good idea. I have seen this same kind of thing for years and always ticks me off. This world will not survive this threat if they continue attacking their own and boasting about it, he says, in as calm a tone as he can manage. Gee, you're uptight, Mr. Marks. Has to be tough to stay that angry all the time. Look, this might be a flawed system, but it's a system open to learning and the people who work here do an honest day's work. My father is one who gets slammed a lot, too, but he doesn't lie to people, and he does his best with what he's given, Chelsea responds. As they enter the elevator, which leads up to Dave's level, Addison answers her defense. How long can you plead ignorance, though? Religion was used to defend ignorance regarding race and sexuality for years. This planet always fears the unknown. If you don't understand it, burn it with fire. This is the mantra of humanity on this planet, and I think it's a shame that it has continued for as long as it has. It's the very reason that the media is going all crazy about the Altillian threat, and now there are rumors that Altillians are walking around disguised as humans that might occupy top levels of the government? Chelsea scratches her head about that one. See, but how do you know Altillians haven't done exactly that? They were here doing all kinds of stuff to our people for months, and no one had a clue. If it weren't for an outside source fighting for fight, figuring out what was going on, we'd still be under their attack. Altillians are amphibians. They require water on a level that your people don't. They can't occupy human skin with their body being made up as it is. It's physically impossible. I don't know, perhaps they paid off government members to help them. Yeah, okay, I'll give you that as a possibility, but then they would have not been after the air ecologies. They were focused on the air ecologies first and foremost. They have tunnel vision, Chelsea. Now, at this point, they might target your elected officials for a way to get people on their side. They're bullies, but they're also cowards, he says, while watching the floor number increases on the elevator. Uh, well then I guess we're even with them there. Look, don't go talk to my father and be all preachy about this kind of stuff. He really hates that. Addison looks down at the elevator floor. You know, I understand that you, that you're some spy or stripper, espionage agent or whatever, but you're crossing a thin line here. I don't appreciate being told what to do. I really can't stand it. That's probably because you're old, she says. My people can live to be 400 years old, he answers. So you guys are like people from the Bible then. No, we're real, he corrects her. Yeah, no need to be a prick, Addison, she says as they reach the desired floor and step out of the elevator and walk right up to the secretary's desk. I need to see my father, she says. He's with someone right now, a major debriefing, she says while filing her nails. He told me not to allow anyone inside. A group then enters the office behind Addison and Chelsea before one of them shoves his way through to the desk. I need to see Dave Bellows. The secretary sighs. Look, you're all going to have to wait. He's with someone right now, and I've been told... Not to let anybody inside. I just killed Blair Drake, the man says, holding up a gun. Go right in, the secretary says, and presses a button to open the door. I'm not going to die for this job. No way. Thanks, miss, Jim Webster says as he heads into the office. The name's Jamie, she says, before 
going back to filing her nails and wishing she had a different job at the moment. There's too much drama here right now and she can't stand it. And I'm Jimmy, he says with a nod. While he heads inside and makes eye contact with Dave. We need to talk, Bellows. Jim Webster's followed by Donna Weber, Don, Donna Meadows, Steve Webster, Addison Marks, and Chelsea Bellows with mixed reasons for being here. Jim commands the stage first, though since he has a gun and just confessed to murder, uh, that makes it pretty much a fait accompli that he gets to talk first. So let's talk about reality, Dave. I'm talking with Miss Keenan here about her time on Arcology 652. This is a better and important, Dave says. Yeah, uh, so I killed Blair Drake. Uh, your entire science division is in a bloody heap. Uh, Blair was a madman, tied my family down to beds to draw blood from them and check DNA samples. It's a good time for you and I to have a really long chat. We don't chat enough, Jim says. And he grabs the personal computer on Dave's table and punches in some numbers. He smirks. He's in your contact list. That's sweet. You did what? Dave can't process this information. It's just too much to fathom all at once. Jim punches in a few numbers and then sits the computer down. A few moments later, John Webster's face appears on his monitor. Dave, what if what did you Jim? Howdy, John, let's talk. What are you doing calling me from Dave's office? Dave has some stuff to talk about with our family. There's important information we've had hidden from us, and we need to have a chat with the powers that be about who the real powers that be are. Can you get down here? John knows Jim wouldn't request this if it wasn't important. I'll be down as soon as possible and I'll bring someone with me. The call ends there as Jim glares at Dave. We have a lot to talk about. I hope you're ready to be on it honest with us. And that's the end of that scene. <laughs> Talia wakes and looks around her dark room. Her curtains are closed and she can't see the clock. She has no clue what time it is right now, but her headache tells her it's not time to drink. She wonders how long it'll be before she forgets this lesson again. It usually takes at least a few months. She slowly sits up and then turns sideways, her feet sliding off of the bed and onto the floor. Her slippers are right there, so she places her feet in them and, gets up and then gets to her feet. She's at least steady on her feet, so she knows she isn't drunk anymore. She slides her feet on the floor as she makes her way to, to the curtains and slowly opens them. The world outside looks bright and cheerful. Birds are singing, people jogging past her window, and she wishes she could just feel as free as they appear to. Instead, she feels like death warmed over, and not just from a hangover. She's been, been uneasy since Mike Translow disappeared. She'd heard rumblings about some sweet, uh, secret project going on, but she had dismissed that as simply a baseless rumor. Now that there was a good chance it was true, she was not as certain as she had been about her place in the scheme of things. Mike's disappearance underlined the facts in this mess, facts she could not overlook. All till it attacked Earth. Statements that these acts were uh, those of terrorists weren't sitting well with her. All till had done this before and conquered Altair, a world they refused to leave. There were rumors they'd been responsible for the charred remains of a world they'd tried to aid. They had arrived too late to be of any help or to see what had happened but many suspected the Altillians. Talia was left throwing, towing the party line and siding with the majority since majority rules. As she heads back to her, to, uh, heads back to her walk-in closet to pick out a dress for today, she thinks back to Dragdon's numerous attempts over the years to convince her to do what she believed was the, what he believed was the right thing. As much as opponents try to portray Dragdon as a desperate and lonely man without a home, she had never known him to be deceptive or out of line in any fashion. He was as honorable man as she had ever met. The only man who was close to this honorable was Mike himself. As she puts on a long red dress and looks, her, looks at herself in the full-length mirror, there's a knock at the door. She makes her way to it as quickly as her headache will allow her to move. It's Missy. Early for you to be here, she says. Missy nods as she bursts into the room and takes a seat in the on the corner of Talia's bed. I had a moment last night. I went with Dragdon on a supply run to Altair. It was amazing to see what those people go through. The security getting in and out has been beefed up, and I was wondering why. Well, Earth did declare war on them, so maybe they're a little jumpy. Missy shakes her head. That'd be true if Earth was capable of space jumps. They can't tra traverse wide areas of space like we we or Altel can, so why bother beefing things up at Altair? I don't know, maybe they suspect an uprising by the Altarians in light of the move Earth made. Again, Missy's left shaking her head. That'd be fine if Altair had, hadn't been fighting back the whole time. They were beaten people, so the idea they would suddenly rise up is unrealistic. The only answer I have is they feel we're coming for them. Yeah, but we're not. Well, no, Kale rightly isn't. You're not. Mike Translow's made it clear what his intentions are. No one's willing to talk seems to know where he is. Those unwilling to talk seem like they're waiting for something. Dragdon's waiting for something. He's very patient, but right now he seems jumpy. And he knows where Mike is. He just won't tell us. I tried to get the information out of him, but he wouldn't give an inch. That's unusual for him. Talia sits on the bed next to Missy. 
My position dictates I'm the leader of the people, a leader who goes by what the majority seek. There's been no movement in the days following the revelations of what was happening on Earth and its people. Our people don't want to get involved and see a declaration of war as a mistake. I can't just go back on that. A lot of people would die. Missy nods. I saw something genuine when Dragon interacted with his people. I'm so glad he brought me along to witness that firsthand, uh, that they have an uphill battle, one that could easily have been us in the first place. I just can't see them not supporting us if we were in their position. Well, we do support them, Talia protests. Missy again shakes her head. We say we do. I know we're aware of what the right thing is to do here. I just don't know that handing out some grain and water is really going to help people in need. Our military could inflict serious damage on Altel's forces there. If we were to attack and join forces with the resistant fighters... She looks Tally in the eyes and then trails off. Sorry, dreaming again. I share that dream on some level, Missy. I really do. My father always spoke to me about doing right by the people and being good to those we rule. But he also spoke of caution. What you're talking about here is reckless and could lead to tremendous loss of life, property, and perhaps the destruction of our people. It's a risk I don't want to take. Missy grabs Talia by the chin and turns her face so they're staring each other in the eyes. Dragon says this is why Altel has already won. And that's the end of that scene. So we'll move on to the next. Dave Bellows is dumbfounded. There are a few things that can silence this man. He's been known as a blowhard for decades, but at this moment, he is at a total loss. He's been going through the records kept by Blair Drake, and he is shaken to his core by this information. He looks at Jim Webster. I knew your brother had tested for perfect DNA, whatever that is, and I wanted to talk to your family about its heritage. I had no idea about any of this. I might be a complete jerk, but this, this is inhuman. Jim sits down on the corner of Dave's desk and looks at Addison Marks. You've been quiet through all of this. Same with Dave's little, little girl there. This is a day of bombshells, so let's hear yours. Before Addison can answer... Dr. Jeff Wakeman bursts into the room with Marianne Webster and Rob Webster close behind. The DNA results are proof. All four of you share the same DNA, perfect in a structure, and that's crazy. Addison nods. That said, somehow I'm apparently the father to all four of you. The room goes silent. Marianne is the only one who moves. She slowly steps forward through the others in the room and over at Addison. She looks into his eyes and sees the eyes of her sons. She sees their strength, their jawline, and she knows this man's telling the truth. So you're the one then, she says with a smile. Addison looks at Marianne and shrugs. The one what? I have no idea how the hell I have four kids. I didn't know I had any kids until I saw John on television and his resemblance to me, his ability to fight and soldier through trying circumstances, and apparently his ability to turn his motions off. I knew he had to be my son. I watched reports on him and then I was certain it was true. But how? He asks, slowly looking around the room. Marianne's beaming now. It was almost 30 years ago. I met you at the hospital. I was considering a job as a nurse at the time, but it never panned out. God only put me there to meet you. Hospital? Addison's still lost. You came into Vancouver General for some weird infection we never saw before, and it cleared up before you left. You had some name for it, knew what it was, and yet no one in the hospital had a clue. Everyone marveled at your ability to recover, and I knew right then you were the one. She says, excited as she tells the secret tale for the first time out loud. Her sons look horrified. But we never... Addison points out as his voice trails off. Marianne nods. When you came in and they ran a battery of tests, they took samples. I had a long talk to one of the doctors who specialized in fertility issues. I lied. I admit it. I told him I couldn't conceive children and I needed help. I even made up a dead husband on the spot. Turned on the waterworks. Mother, what are you admitting? Steve exclaims. Language, Stephen. Just, just careful there now. Don't be yelling at your mother. Now, I was fortunate... That he helped me, and as years passed, I managed to keep a sample viable to be used on two other occasions. When the twins here were born, I knew my family was complete, and I owe it all to you, she says, trying to hug Addison, only to have him pull, a, pull away from, a, from her. You're out of your mind, he says before looking over at Jim. Trauma? Jim shrugs. She's just surprised the hell out of all of us, guy. I don't have any answers for you on this one. At least... We won't be asking you for any financial assistance. I just, yeah, this is too weird, he says, and leans back against the wall with his face in his hands. Addison looks the Web Webster boys over. It's amazing. Same dark brown hair as me, same blue eyes, same skin tone. Same subtle differences all around. But I can see myself in all of you. Dominant genes over hers, Dave says as if he's an expert. Now, how the hell do you have different DNA from the rest of us anyway? You from Krypton or some other 
weird world we haven't heard of, he asks with a sarcastic grin. Conley, actually, Addison replies. My planet was a thriving world of peace and science. My people were good people, and then the Altillians came. When they were done, our planet was reduced to ashes. We sent out distress signals, but they were never answered. Yes, they were, Mike Translow says as he enters the room, his jaw almost on the floor in shock at what he was walking into. He extends a hand to Addison Marks. Name's Mike Translow. I'm from Falteris, he says, as he shakes hands with his fellow alien on Earth. We came to help when we received your signal, but we traveled at near light speed and found out what a mistake that was. Uh, time slows near light speed, Addison says with a nod. How the heck do we meet like this, Mike? Small galaxy? You up for a trip? Mike asks with a smile. Yeah, yeah, I totally need a trip, Addison says, darting a look at Marianne and then grabbing Jim by the arm and motioning the brothers to follow. John Webster enters the office and sees his brother with a man he's never seen before leaving with Mike. Who's that guy? John asks, I'm your father. Addison answers, I need a drink. Rob says as he follows at the rear of this bizarre parade out of the day, out of Dave Bella's office. He looks over at John. I guess we were just recruited. So the Webster family is all together. Brings them all into one nice little neat Real. grouping. All right. Gora stands outside and looks skyward. The Altillion ships are magnificent to him. Their round disc shapes makes them perfect in terms of maneuverability. Their firepower is unmatched throughout the galaxy. On this day, they're performing for his benefit. They're weaving between one another and leaving behind color trails to smoke, of smoke to spell out words, make pictures, and generally entertain the leader of their world. Next to Gora stands Ver. Next to Ver stands a nervous Sabal. This is all the idea of Ver. He believes that putting Sabal out front will show renewed faith in the man, even if only when the cameras are not watching. Ver's had to argue on Sabal's behalf throughout this, and now they're on the verge of something grand here. Ver doesn't see himself as a middleman. He stands between the leader of his world and the man who wants the job back so bad he can taste it. Ver himself keeps his political ambitions quiet. He prefers being low profile and waiting for the right opportunity to present itself. This is the formula he's followed from the very beginning of his career. Altel's not the only world which has an Altelian population. Altair is the only other known place where anyone from their world lives. But there's a place only the highest ranking of officials know about. Ver has a keen interest in the little known world they've named Zenith. Zenith is a planet within the same solar system as Altel, but one that sits closer to their sun and appears in the sky as the brightest star, in quotes, overhead. It is, however, often seen just above the horizon after their sun has set. To the majority of the Altillian population, Zenith is a de desert world with little water, only crude insect and plant life, and no advanced life, life forms. They didn't know that there were exiles there. Men and women of their kind were sent there if deemed unworthy, unworthy of living on Altill, and only Gora could make such a determination. If it was there to keep the bad element out of their population, dissenting voices and ones who felt they should be able to elect a ruler. Ver was well-versed on Zenith and its place in Altel's history. He had personally had a hand in a number of people being sent there, and he was proud of that accomplishment. He just couldn't tell anyone he was proud of this stance. He had his low profile, and he had to maintain it. He had been careful about when to get in Gora's ear and who to get in him about. If need be, he is perfectly fine with getting Sabel exiled. With Gora lacking an heir to the throne on Altil and the dangers of war, meaning his position is a precarious one indeed. There could be as many as three worlds gunning for Gora, and if Sabel were exiled, that would leave Ver as the likely heir to the throne. There are plans formulating in Ver's mind as he watches the air show going on. He knows this is for Gora, and it makes sense that Gora is amused by fancy flying ships and pretty colors. If this were Ver's air show, the, the, this would be a show of force here. Automated ships being shot down by Altillian fighters in a true show of their amazing war machine that they possessed. When he becomes leader, he can make shows work on this level, which he feels is above that of Gora or Sabel. Sabel, meanwhile, is well aware of Zenith and doesn't worry himself about being sent there. He's been an ally of Gora for a long time. He knows certain facts about Gora which give him blackmail material should he ever need it. It's likely this knowledge saved him from being executed or exiled upon his return. The plan has been in place for some time that if Sabal were to disappear under suspicious circumstances that certain information would be divulged to the public, which would call Gora's position into question. There were enough points where this information would come from that he isn't worried about Gora erasing his, this potential threat. It's a row of three men, each with their own ambitions, 
but only Gora really holds the hammer here. His father named him ruler of this world, and he intends to remain in this position. His coming trip to Earth will solidify his place in history, at least in his mind. He will pacify the Earthlings and convince them not to make war against such a superior foe. He will then set about killing them all in devious and fun ways of his own creation. Though it is a business trip and will be used to display the military might his world has, he intends to bring himself some entertainment in the form of Trake. Trake, the red-skinned and scaly creature born of Conley. His performance is an art form to Gora, one that Earthlings might even appreciate. He just had to make certain that Trake was secure. Trake lives with the others in his caves assigned by Gora, ones which protected them from the heat and humidity of Altel's surface, though Altelians were adept in existing in other environments. Few could stand theirs without some form of protection. It was harsh. It was a harsh and swamp-filled world they lived on, one which could only grow hotter as years passed, but they were capable of handling this, handling this and much more if need be. Conley had been a world of many varieties of life which were destroyed now. Trake was one of the few of his kind left, and he'd been alive for a very long time. He appeared not to age at all from Gora's perspective, and that made it even all the more amazing. It sometimes made Gora with his... It sometimes hmm, made Gora with his father... Okay, what did I mean to say there? It sometimes uh, caused Gora and his father to keep uh, more life forms from that world for study. Yeah, it sounds better. Perhaps if he wanted to prevent any kind of resistance to his rule here, uh, mercy could be viewed by as weakness by most of his people. The strategy, strategy of firebombing that planet seemed to be the best one at the time. As the fighters finish their fancy moves overhead, Gora sees Trake being placed on his ship in his cage. It's amazing that such a creature in a cramped and confined space could produce tremendous performances upon exiting such a depressing home. He could spend weeks in the cage and still perform like a champion moments after being freed. This is what made Trake almost a hero to Gora. If he'd been born in Altil, he would truly be a hero and not as flawed as he was. Ver is still Ver is still looking up at the show, but only because Gora is. He has to appear to enjoy it and not appear to be distracted. Ver knows the drill here. The being, be, the, uh, that being to get Gora into his good graces. Show Gora that you're a team player and that you're on the same page as he is. Never let him know how you really feel. Sabel too, is watching the show while his mind wanders. When they go to Earth, he has to tide himself away from the media. He just wonders how long he can do that, especially if rumors about Mike Translow being there are true. He wants to kill Mike Translow with every fiber of his being. He wants his wife, too. He wants to show Falteris that Mercy is truly foolish and to destroy their, uh, their will to fight by taking out two of the most well-known supporters of a, world against, war, of a war against his world. In his mind, there is nothing that can come between him and the throne. Once he has that, he can create any war he wants at any time. He can forego these shows of wonder and bliss in favor of blood and horror. He wants to replace these events with ones that display the superiority of himself and his people on a very visceral level. He wants uh, to snap Mike Translow's neck and watch him drop as millions from all till are cheering him on. Anything less than that is unacceptable. That was crazy timing. I just put in the last pin. Yeah, that's, that's how I planned it. I that planned the whole thing nice that way. Me to plan that. Yeah, I did. I, I did. I have a perfect sense of timing. It's it's one of my one of my best You're qualities. Such a dork. It's one of my best things. Dork. Not though. Got all those. You're not allowed to call me that. All those caps all pinned. Yep. And get those. Hi, Shadow. Sewn together He's tomorrow. He's been at my feet listening to me read I the know, story too. I know that was too. funny. Did you hear him? I heard the thump 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 upstairs yep. from when I was. Yeah, he's is it fine. Shadow or is it the boys? He's you fine. You hear him come down the stairs, and then he comes right here and just yeah. looking at you. Hey. Just, he's like, "Hey, he's hey. reading. He's reading." Hey. I want him to pick me up. Hey. So yep. He does. He just stands, sits there. Hey, he just sat at my feet, looking up at me, waiting for me to pay attention, and now he purrs like crazy because I picked him up. <laughs> That's what he does. He's a good cat. Yes, he is. There you go, Shadow. All right. So there you go. You guys are all caught up for, for tonight. And uh, we'll do this again in a few weeks. And uh, I'm, I'm hoping to get these posted a little earlier. Uh, we had kind of a, another crazy day today. They're all kind of turning out to be crazy days. It really is. So, but we're getting through it. We're doing our best. And uh, thank you mm -hmm. to the about 200 people that are still watching these every day. That's why we're still doing them. Uh, it's we're not still for her. doing them because I like them. It's really not for her. 
And I'm thinking too that I had an idea. I had an idea like 20 years ago to do like a, a nine part series where I would plot it out. And I don't know. Maybe that would work where I did like Into the Void as a nine part and just plot the whole thing out. And I could have like a cross between generations and, you know, that whole thing. It's like Star Wars. But, but I would have it actually work. I'd have it where it's one vision from the first part right through to the ninth and that it's it's this right. great way of telling the story and, and I could bring in the Andromeda Galaxy and all of the things that I did in the original series. So, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I, I've had that on my mind. And then a guy who's in uh, eFeds, which is online fake wrestling, I figured, yeah, I can I can do that. It's so all your spare time. Well, because I had an idea for a name. I had an idea for a name, and I thought, I need to have twins. One's named Mo, and one's named Less, so they're Mo or Less. And I was like, that's perfect. So that's a great one, and I can just go from there. Mo or Less. And that'll be awesome. They have to be twin brothers. And and then we go from there. So I already told the guy who runs the site what I was doing, and he's like, oh, that sounds great. So that should be fun. And these are guys that I did this with like 20 years ago. So it, it's kind of a nice, remember before the world went and blew up on us? It's one of those things. So that could be kind of fun. And I could do wrestling promos on here too, because then I don't have to write them out. So, and since they're twin brothers, I could be both of them, right? So I could just turn my hat backwards when I'm Mo or when I'm less. Yeah, that'll work. That'll work. All right. All kidding aside, uh, although I'm, I'm not kidding about the E-Fed thing, I'm doing that because uh, it might be fun. Uh, and, and yeah, so remember, stay home, stay safe as much as possible. Uh, we've seen a, a very nice flattened curve here in, in BC. Things are going pretty it's well. It's starting to go down. It, it is. And it looks like a majority of the cases are either in, in old age homes there's or the prisons. prisons. So there's a good news, bad news of that. The bad news, of course, is that those are, are enclosed spaces and it's really hard to shut it down in those enclosed spaces. And then the, the good news is it means we're not getting that community spread because we're staying home. So, again, you know, stay safe, stay home. There's a reason they want us to keep doing that. And I will continue to read stories uh, all the way through. Uh, but thank you guys so much for all your support. And I will talk to you again soon.